Hello and welcome to the Shed Sounds Media YouTube channel. My name is Ian Beabout, and today we will be taking a look at my favorite album historically. Um, and oh, that's a that's a fly on my head. <laughs> okay. Hello and welcome to the Shed Sounds Media YouTube channel. My name is Ian Beabout. And I thought I would do a special video because the album that I've historically rated as my favorite of all time um, just turned 51 last week. And there's apparently a new reissue on the way. Of course, I'm talking about A Passion Play, the controversial 1973 recording by Jethro Tull, which was the follow-up to their Billboard number one album in the United States, Thick as a Brick, which it quickly plummeted from that summit uh, because for some reason there was a big movement against this album, uh, especially in the critical arena. But uh, if you talk to any fans who were around at the time or anyone who attended concerts, it was a popular show and people loved it. And I always have, when I say always, um, I'm talking about as a young person. I got my very first stereo for Christmas and uh, got some CDs from my parents. At the time, my dad was into collecting Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab discs, um, which for years, this was the best way to hear this album, at least until the Stephen Wilson mix came out, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. As a kid, listening to this stuff for the first time and getting a lot of my dad's replaced CDs, uh, which I still, I wish I still had that old copy of A Passion Play, and maybe I do somewhere, but um, I remember listening to this one and uh, Aqualung and Thick as a Brick and Stormwatch. I remember hearing those all on my little CD player um, for the first time, and the reason that a passion play resonated with me, the reason why a passion play resonated with me as a very young person, I think was due to the obtuse nature of its lyrics. And that was something that I kept coming back to again and again. And I knew that it was basically a story about the afterlife um, somebody dies at the beginning of, uh, the album. That's why you hear the heartbeat ramping up and then coming down to a crash. And, um, I think that the person is presented with, uh, a series of, um, recollections of his life as well as, um, you know, like within, within the memory bank, uh, he sits in like a movie theater and he sees his life playing before his eyes, but he's also given the option to either side with good or God or bad, evil, the devil. Um, but I think ultimately what happens is our main character, um, Ronnie Pilgrim, decides to be reincarnated, uh, potentially as an animal, um, and he decides to come back to Earth. Uh, at the end. And it, at least that's my interpretation of it. But as a kid, I think I related to this more than some of the other tall records. Um, and, you know, th this could have something to do with my own makeup and um, maybe experiences with loss, even as a young person. Um, I, I kind of was always fascinated by the afterlife and what might be out there, even though I've never been particularly religious, and neither has Ian Anderson. Um, but uh, I, I still had a fascination with that sort of thing. And I think the fact that there was no easy understanding of this album's lyrics, and they are so obtuse, I think that that's what kept me coming back again and again and again, and drilling this album into my brain. Um, to the point where, you know, I basically, it, it's, it's seeped into my DNA. It's part of me now. Um, and because every time I return to it, you know, that, that familiarity thing, um, happened. And I think that listening to this album at such an impressionable age, 
um, may have set me up for seeking challenging experiences from my art and entertainment as a, a teenager and an adult, such as taking an interest in the music of Frank Zappa and other progressive rock bands like Gentle Giant, uh, King Crimson, Yes, um, I, I, Captain Beefheart. I feel like it all came from my obsession with a passion play and not only trying to wrap my brain around the lyrical themes, but the music as well, which is quite complex. This is perhaps the peak Jethro Tull lineup. You know, of course, Ian Anderson on vocals and saxophone, acoustic guitars, um, flute, Martin Barr on guitar, Jeffrey Hammond on bass, um, John Evan on keyboards, and Barry Barlow on drums. Uh, you also have Dee Palmer showing up and doing some orchestration, such as on The Hair Story. Um, she would later become a full-fledged member of the band um, in the following years. So it's cool that she was kind of always there. The other CD that I had, other than Tall CDs, was a Winnie the Pooh soundtrack. And this is, um, these are very British, very quaint stories where animals take on human characteristics. And I kind of feel like as a young person, I probably related more to the characters in The Hare Who Lost His Spectacles story um, than I did in uh, to a lot of other media at that time because it it was so close already to uh, you know the Winnie the Pooh stories that I loved and um, that twee Englishness and I think that that's one thing that sort of is a roadblock for a lot of people is that hair story the best way to approach this album is to clear your mind of anything else that you've heard before, even other tall music, and try to approach this with the fresh, impressionable childhood imagination and see how you like it. I feel like that childlike nature is one of the many charms of this record and something that keeps me coming back to it again and again. It's almost like a recharge for me. It's, it's like reminding me of where I came from and maybe um, why I'm doing what I'm doing. I did have a question from uh, a viewer about how I felt about the Stephen Wilson remix. There was always this feeling with the original mix that things were more glued together and instruments were harder to distinguish one from the next, guitar, bass, saxophone, keyboards. Everything kind of sounded more glued together, melded together. Um, whereas Stephen Wilson's remix has uncovered a lot of that murkiness and revealed these performances at their essence. And I think that this has a lot to do with what Ian Anderson says in the booklet. Uh, he says that one of the first things that Stephen Wilson did with the 2014 mixes was he stripped back a lot of overdubs um, such as doubling of guitar parts and, and stacking different parts that, that are basically unnecessary. And this makes it so much more transparent. And you can really hear the elements, the performance elements coming through. It's probably a better representation of what the band sounded like live than the original album was. And for that, I'm going to say I prefer the Wilson mix. Um, I do think it's a much more musically satisfying way to hear this album. There's also some other issues with the original mix, such as I don't care for how side A ends in the middle of the hair story, the hair who lost his spectacles. I kind of feel like the album would have been better served if they would have put the whole hair story on the end of side one or the whole hair story at, at the beginning of side two. Because, you know, had they put it at the end of side one, people who don't like the hair story, which I, I totally get, um, people who don't like it uh, could just pick up the needle and flip the record over. And I can feel detractors of the record turning over the record and thinking, oh, it's still going on. Like, this is still happening. And I, I kind of like it that the Mobile Fidelity Sound Labs and then also the Stephen Wilson mix decided to present the album broken up into tracks 
That's how I always grew up with it, and I'm glad that that stuck with an officially released tall version because I never really liked it as one song either, one 45-minute song. Another comment is that there's uh, a little snippet of music that is added into side two, and I really like hearing this. I, I It's kind of part of the album to me. Uh, apparently, it was something that Stephen Wilson found and edited back in, and I like it. I like having it there, and I now kind of miss it from the original mix. Also, um, apparently, there's some spots where the saxophone was snipped out of the remix and kind of tucked back, and I don't really notice it is the thing. Like, it, the cuts that were made were so minimal that I don't really notice it. And I also do notice, though, that the saxophone is a little bit lower in the mix on the remix, and, and I'm fine with that, too. Um, I, I like having Martin Barr's guitar higher up in the mix. For instance, uh, on Magus Perde, which is I think is probably the, the best part of the album, and, and that's kind of the last, uh, the last song that happens, uh, there's a part on the 5.1 remix where Martin plays the Magus Perde uh, guitar riff, and it sounds like Martin's sitting in the room. It, it's such a clean and uh, um, incredibly transparent translation of the mix that it very much sounds like you're sitting in the room with these guys. I really like this album, um, and I always have. It's always been an album that's inspired me to think creatively. It's always been an album that um, just... It challenged me in a way that I liked um, and maybe encouraged me to seek out challenging art, music, and films um, and and to, to listen to things often, not just take my gut reaction on something, but to give everything a fair chance and to listen to it more than once and try to figure out what it's all about. Um, I feel like this album is very responsible for that ethic that I've always had when it comes to music. Um, so that's my opinion. Um, I'd be curious to know yours. If you could please consider dropping a comment and let me know how you feel about the Passion Play album, that would be awesome. You could also let me know how you feel about the Wilson mix. Some people have said that the Wilson mix saved the record for them. They didn't used to like it, but the Wilson mix uncovered uh, the inherent charms for them. I don't feel this way. I always loved it, but I feel like the Wilson mix made me love it more. And that that's important. Um, also, don't forget that if you enjoyed this, to like the video and to subscribe to the channel if you'd like to hear some more from me. Um, also, if you would like to support the channel with a donation, I have included uh, a link to my Amazon wish list in the description. And of course, anything that you send in um, has a chance of being covered uh, here on the channel. So I would greatly appreciate it if you can and if you want to. Um, but until then, my name's Ian Beabout. It's been a real pleasure talking to you and you'll hear from me real soon. Bye-bye.